Hi. Uh, welcome to the Designate uh, overview talk. Uh, we'll be running through Designate and how it can be used in your clouds to improve uh, customers' use of DNS. So what we'll be covering is what DNS is, how you can interact with it, so using the API or the client libraries, how we work with DNS servers and the existing DNS servers we work with, and then finally, how you can use notifications to auto-create domains and records uh, as, as people create resources on your cloud. So my name is Graham Hayes. I'm a software engineer on the DNS as a service team at HP Helion. On my left is Andre Carlson, who's a, who's a colleague of mine on that team. We also have Vinod Mangapali and Tim Simmons, who are software developers in Rackspace's cloud DNS team. So what is Designate? Designate basically means to give meaning or status to something. So that's effectively what DNS is. We give a label to an IP address, and it, 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 gives, it, a, it gives us a status. So Designate allows people to very easily create DNS records without having to go through the pain of editing DNS zone files or writing to a database or <clears throat> any of the other methods like the traditional DNS servers would uh, would ask people to do to create DNS. It's also multi-tenanted, so it can be set up once uh, by your ops team and used by all of your customers. So it saves the infrastructure of multiple people running multiple DNS networks in the same cloud. So <clears throat> this is the current overview of the architecture within Designate. We have a fairly simple architectural overview. We have an API service, which, effect which just takes the input from the user validates it, makes sure that they're authenticated via Keystone, and passes it over an AMQP queue into Central. This is where we have all our business logic. So it <clears throat> creates the record, makes sure that the, it, it's a valid uh, domain and that you have access to it, and it stores it to a database. It then tells a uh, mini DNS, which is a service that, it's a, it's a, it's a micro DNS server that talks to the, 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 the main DNS servers that your customers use. So it uses traditional DNS zone transfer to get information from the designate database onto the presentation DNS servers. Now, we are going to be changing this in the next cycle, which Vinod will be going into in a few minutes. So Vinod, we're talking about pools. So pools is a concept that we introduced in the current uh, cycle killer. Pools are a set of discrete uh, name servers. Why pools? If you are a corporation having, that wants to have a separate namespace for internal and external uh, sites, pools allows you to do that. You could have a private pool for your internal sites and a public-facing pool for all of your external sites. The other advantage with pools is also that pools, with pools you can have different capabilities and you can have different sets of different levels of service. If you have a large number of domains, you could also split the load among the name servers with having different, having a number of pools. The other advantage that uh, pools also provides for developers is the backend plugins is simplified a lot. Currently, for the backend plugins, are responsible for all of the operations, any of the uh, operations that change data. For each API operation that changes data, you need to have a corresponding operation in the plugin that changes data in the in backend. For example, if you change or modify, um, if you modify or create, delete a record set, for a bind plugin, you would probably need to modify the zone file and then do a corresponding RNDC call to inform bind about the changes. Going forward with pools and mini DNS, as Graham had talked earlier, this simplifies a lot. The backends can get all the changes from the mini DNS. Since the mini DNS talks the DNS protocol, you, but the backend at the, doesn't really matter what backend you're using. It can just, as long as it talks to the DNS protocol, it can get changes from the mini DNS using AXFR currently. The plugins are just responsible for the creation and deletion of zones. 
So how does this lo look like? So for the happy path, the user makes some changes through the API. The API talks to the central. Central passes the changes into the storage. It then informs the pool manager. The pool manager, in the case of create and delete, it talks to the backend. And the plugin informs, makes the necessary changes on the backend DNS servers. For any changes, the pool manager talks to the mini DNS. So there are two functionalities that the mini DNS provides for the pool manager. One is to inform of a, the, any, cha any changes in the zones. Mini DNS sends out and notify to the backend DNS name servers. And the backend DNS name servers on receiving a notify send out an AXFR and an AXFR. Currently, we support AXFR. We are planning to support AXFR in the current cycle. So mini DNS then sends the updated zone to the backend DNS uh, servers. The other functionality that we also provide, the mini DNS provides to the pool manager is to actually check whether the change has made into the mini DNS, into the backend servers. Mini DNS queries the serial number it, of the zone to the backend to change, verify whether the change has made it into the backend. Once that is there, it informs the pool manager, and then the pool manager marks the change as active. So the user can actually check whether it's active at that point. Now, Tim Simmons will talk about the API. Hey, so now that you know a little bit about what Designate is, um, we're going to tell you kind of how it works or how you can work with it uh, in your you know, applications and services. So Designate features a RESTful API like any other OpenStack service mostly. Um, there's a few features here I want to talk about. You can filter on resource data. So for your domain, say, you can say, um, you know, give me all my domains where the domain name is like this or equal to this. Um, you can paginate your queries to the API. So if you've got a lot of resources, you can you know, simplify that a little bit. Nested collections are a feature in some of our resources that allow um, a very focused changing in certain places to allow you to minimize the number of queries you're going to have to make to change a lot of things. The API is easy to extend. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. Uh, there's pretty robust policy enforcement, so there's a lot of different things that you can allow only users or admins to do. Um, and right now, the version 2 API for Designate is experimental in Kilo. Uh, should be the, the last cycle. Some of the resources that you can manage, um, you can see here zones, record sets, records, um, top-level domains, blacklisted domains, quotas, and um, new, very recently, pools. So zones are kind of the primary resource that you'll be dealing with. Um, traditionally, these would map to zone files on your customer-facing or you know, application-facing DNS servers. Um, they contain a number of sub-resources, you know, traditionally records, record sets. And the fields that you would give to this kind of thing would be your domain name, your TTL, um, and maybe a description. It's also possible in Designate to import and export zones. So we provide an API that if you change the accept header to text DNS on imports, we'll take that um, zone file, hopefully, from somewhere else that you have and uh, you know, parse that and put it in Designate. And if you're trying to maybe migrate away from Designate or maybe just back up your zones, you can uh, export them so that you can kind of have, have that peace of mind or uh, have an ease of moving between systems. There's also a tool um, in our contrib directory allowing you to uh, take some zone files from a server that you've already got and uh, prepare them for import into Designate. See, it's a pretty simple zone file that you get out. Um, and it's, it's a good feature to have. Record sets are a very important resource in Designate. It's, uh, you know, all of the various record types that you might use on a daily basis, A's, quad A's, C names, et cetera. Um, you see the ones we support now, but it's pretty easy uh, if you have some other weird record type that you like to use to add to Designate. It's, uh, we encapsulate them into objects. And each record set type has a different uh, data field that you can see um, in records. 
that will be uh, important for that record type. So for A records, that would be an IP address. For C names, a fully qualified domain name, SOA records, expiries, retries, uh, that type of thing. You can see that record sets have a kind of sub-resource that would be records, and you can modify a list of them or add or you know, delete many of them at one time. It's one of those nested collections I was talking about. What? TLDs are another thing that's useful to manage. So there's a lot of TLDs out there. You know, they're adding new ones seemingly every day. So in Designate, you might want to allow only certain ones to be added to your system, and this is what this lets you do. By default, Designate will allow any TLD, but when you start adding them uh, through a convenient API, you get a, a very fine-grained control on the ones that you want allowed in your system. So here we're adding .com. It's very simple. You just add com, and now your system will allow com domains. You can also add blacklisted domains. So these would be domains that you don't want in your system uh, for customers or other people to add. So you, know, you could imagine that there's a lot of domains that you might not want in your system, and it would be tedious to put in every single one of those. So designate allows you to use a regular expression to enable or uh, to, to disable a, a big block of zones. So you can see here that in the first example, we have example.com being disabled. And in the second example, all of the subdomains of example.com and example.com being disabled. So pretty useful. You can also get uh, floating IP pointers to your PTR, rec or you can make PTR records um, to your floating IPs in Neutron. So an operator would delegate the inadder.arpa zone to designate. And then users could make PTR records um, that were associated with IPs that uh, are on their tenant in Neutron, which, can, which is uh, pretty helpful. It's also really easy to extend the API. So you know, there are various reasons that you might want to extend an API. You might want to change the way something, you know, something works or um, add, add some custom endpoint, maybe that calls a service that's not in scope for designate, or maybe you just got some custom code that you want to throw in there. Um, it's, it's really easy. So all you need to do is create a controller and a view, just like uh, any other API in designate. Um, just using Picon, you know, like most of you probably know how to use. Add an entry point and uh, add it to your configuration file, and you're good to go. So I'm going to talk to uh, Andre about the client. Yeah, so I'll mention a few things about the uh, client or the client CLI libraries stuff. So the client is kind of like any other client that you have in OpenStack, like Nova, Cinder, Neutron. It's like uh, it comes with a library to like uh, use in your Python scripts, but it also has a CLI that you can use. Currently, we're offering only the client for v1, so you'll not be able to use it for the v2 one yet, since it's not stable. Um, it also provides a lot of diagnostic stuff you can do. Like, in, for example, Neutron, you have some debugging stuff as well. We have the same level of thing, kind of. Um, it's also the thing you as an operator or as a user would use when you're interacting from the command line. So what you can do with the, with the CLI, you can create records. So I mean, sorry, create zones. So say you're wanting to create like example.com, it's like designate domain create and then dash dash name and the zone name. You can also give it the TTL you want at the same time and the email that's going to be responsible for that zone. You can also, to like show the information about a zone, you can do like domain dash get and then the zone ID. You can list a whole list of zones that you have in your tenant or the project by using dash list instead, like domain dash list. There is a uh, ability to update zones, like if you want to specify a new TTL or you want to change the responsible email for that zone, you use a uh, domain update and then you can give it the ID and then the dash dash TTL option to set like a new TTL of say 800, 1800 seconds. You can delete a zone, 
by giving it the ID and we'll delete the zone and all its records. So you can also operate on records, like if you want to create a new A record for your server, you can do that by doing record create, giving it the zone ID again, and then setting the name. You'll have to give it like www.example.com, and then a type of A, and then like a data field of the IP. You can read records as well, or list them and read them, like, uh, like you have a Neutron. There is a way to list networks and to show the network as well to get the details. We have the same thing for records. Um, you can update. Actually, that slide is wrong. You have to get a record get and then the domain ID and the record ID to get it. Um, for updating a record, you can say, I want to set a TTL on a record. Say you have an MX record for a mail server, and you're wanting to s change that. You can change the TTL just for that record by giving it the TTL option when you're updating it. And to delete a record, you can use the delete command to delete that record. If you're, say, removing an A record for something. So when it comes to diagnostics, we have a few tools for giving you like uh, the ability to sync a zone. So if you find out that your zone is out of sync on your name server versus what is in designate, you can use the diagnostics command. Either synchronize all domains, or synchronize one domain, or you can synchronize a given record. But that usually triggers the synchronization of the whole domain anyways, because the way of the backend works. So you can get some reporting statistics as well. You can get like counts on different things, which is mentioned up there. You can also report stuff just for a given tenant, like how many domains they have, which is pretty useful at times when we're wondering how many uh, domains are in the system, how many domains is in one tenant, or any other accounts that we support at the moment. So next up, I'll mention designate sync, which is, um, we named it sync because it was like a kitchen sink for all the events coming in. So this is basically how we take a notification coming in from Nova or Neutron or any other system and do something useful with it. We can have, like, you can make your own thing as well, like to extend it or customize a given handler that we have. Uh, a handler is just a Python class or an object which will um, get loaded by Steve Dor in the sync. So to create your own, you can just check the example there, and it's just like the uh, controller example that Tim mentioned for the API. So say you want to create a, a record for a VM when you give it a flowing IP. You can enable the uh, Neutron thing, I mean the Neutron handler, but first you need to always have a domain ready usually for the handlers that comes with the sync from like the standard ones. So you create a domain that you want your VM's floating IPs to reside in. Um, and you enable the notification handler in the sync section. And then you need to give it the ID of the domain. So when you've done that, you basically start or restart the sync service at the moment. It doesn't load it from any database. Then you boot a VM, so that's fine. And then you give it a floating IP, like in Neutron or via the Nova CLI. And then Sync will get like any other service listening for notifications. It'll receive the notification and will actually call out to Central and will say, hey, make me a new record with the name of this VM dot, or I mean appended by the domain name that you have. So, questions? I think there's microphones uh, across the floor there, if anyone has any questions. So, currently, how are um, providers providing uh, DNS abilities to tenants without designate? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, without designate, um, how are um, 
providers providing DNS services to the tenants? Do you have any ideas? I'm, as far as I know, the, there's no, no major open site providers bar Rackspace who provide DNS service to their tenants. You guys had a proprietary version. Yep. It's still running. Um, okay. There's nothing else currently in OpenStack that does it. Is there uh, integration uh, with Solometer for notifications or something like that? Uh, we emit a lot of notifications, um, and they can be read by Solometer. We haven't done any actual, we haven't fully integrated with them yet. Okay. Where's the uh, where's the client code at? And is guaranteed? So so it's it's is it released in Juno or is it? What, what's its status as a program or sub program? As a program, i.e., can we rely on it working and upgrading correctly into Kilo? Yes, um, it's currently an incubator project. We got incubated in Juno. Uh, there is a current production instance of designate running in a public accessible production instance. So. We won't break ourselves. We can make sure there's an upgrade path. Um, the V1 API is stable, and the V2 API should be marked stable in Kilo. We're waiting. We just want to make sure we implement the right features before we call it stable, and we don't, and not causing us to cause to have another version because we wanted to add something to it. You said there's a public version available. Is that on the HP cloud? Yeah. How do, how do, so, what what do I need to enable to do something like an example.com on the HP cloud to test this? If you log into your HP Cloud account and go to Horizon, there's an Activate Services button at the top, and there should be a DNS button there. And once you do that, you'll have the Horizon interface to designate, and you'll, be able, also to use, be, able to use the client you'll be able to use the client as well, yeah. Thank you. Um, is, there, is it pluggable at all? I mean, can we use the API and plug in a different DNS backend to it? Like a d different DNS server? Yeah, and all the the processes to update the the external DNS. Yeah, well, the, the 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 back pretty much everything is pluggable. The uh, backends are all fully pluggable, so we have backend support for bind, DNS, NSD, free IPA. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else. Info blocks has a backend coming in as well. They have yeah. one in um, their own just and then, repo. And there's a there is a Microsoft DNS one being released as well. So that, that was in your diagram when you had the back end at the top, but it's still going to use the mini DNS for uh, yeah. transfers to that. We are, there, we, at the moment, we're, that's how we're planning on pushing out the information. There is potential for other avenues if, there, if, if, it, if there's going to be a small, use, small amount of people that won't be suitable for. So we have, we, that's one of the sessions we had this morning, actually, in the Design Summit, was how to enable people to have non-DNS transfer of information. Uh, using, try, trying to, to be more like the traditional backends we have currently. And, um, and is there any link between the DHCP processes in, uh, in Neutron? Not yet. Okay. Um, it's, we only just got incubated, so it's been, we're trying to get integration with Neutron is very difficult until you're incubated, and even then, it requires a lot of work on both sides. Do you, does it, is there any support for the dynamic DNS into designate? Uh, the RFC dynamic DNS? Yeah. Uh, no, but it is definitely on our roadmap. It's something we want to do. Okay. Seen with Sync, the name of the VM can be automatically assigned. Uh, how is the name selected? Is that the instance name or something? Yes, yeah, the instance name that comes through in the notification. Yeah, so actually, there is a. It, there is a format option, so you can actually set in the config for the handler what it's going to use from the uh, notification. So if you have any other data coming in from Neutron or Nova, you can actually use that, and it will be like a string template in Python that we'll use. Anything else? Uh, current, uh, the, the, the question it, was, what's the uh, deployment recommendation? Current, it, it doesn't really matter where you can run it on a control node or you can run it on VMs. Uh, either will work. So we're actually running it on the public cloud in HP. So we're running it like a series of VMs. Yeah, we currently there. run in production in VMs. Yes. Uh, it, uh, everything talks pretty much via RabbitMQ internally. So you can scale out any of the, anything that you think is going to be hit hard or needs a lot of resources. And it can, if one of the centrals dies, for example, the others will just take up the slack. 
Uh, yeah. To piggyback on the last question about instance names being mapped automatically and designate, what happens if you have two VMs with the same name? Well, that's, it's a valid record. You can create a record with two IP addresses. It's a, you can have two records with the same name and different IP addresses. Okay, so it's like a round robin, for instance? Yeah, that would create a round robin record, for example. Um, the handlers that we ship with, are, they're supposed to be examples. They're not designed, they're, they're, they're not, they, they'll work for most use cases, but if you want to do something, something co uh, more complex with them, it's very easy to extend them and put whatever logic you want in into, the, into, into those uh, handlers. Okay, thanks. You had a question? Oh, can you repeat that? Yeah, I mean, as it, the way you presented the service that it was meant for the infrastructure of the service. No, it's so. Um, well, I mean, you can use it like any other service in your cloud as a user as well. It's public, publicly accessible. So you can use, anybody can use the API or you can have your control panel integrate with the API to put in whatever data that a user wants to. So there's a lot, you can use, any person can use it once it's stood up somewhere. So you can have many tenants and many users using it. For example, HP Cloud, a lot of people, loads of people point their NS records at our, NS, uh, at our name servers and use the Horizon interface or the command line to manage their own DNS. It's the, the, the sync handler is just an example for, it's an example, it wouldn't necessarily be used by a large scale public cloud for doing the auto, auto generation of names. It's an example, to, it, they're put in place to give people an idea of how you can use the handlers and to go and extend them as they see fit. I, I, the, it's mainly aimed at end users rather than infrastructure for getting, so it makes, it makes it easier for end users to manage DNS rather than them having to write its own files and run DNS servers themselves. Hi. Um, concerning the notification sync, you introduced one for floating IP auto uh, registration. Yeah. I wonder if there are a similar one, but for internal IPs. Let's say I have uh, two VMs I want to uh, register it automatically and uh, use FQDN to communicate instead of an IP. Yeah, there is a Nova fixed IP one as well, but the problem is um, we don't, um, so that would end up creating like a Nova name on a public DNS with a internal IP. Yeah. So at the moment we don't have um, we don't have like a DNS thing inside of the tenants network. But once the uh, pool stuff is in place and the MDNS stuff is working more, we can plug that in there and we can have like a tenant network only visible DNS server mm -hmm. that answers that. Okay. So that's kind of like uh, all the pool stuff and all that is kind of leading up to features like that. All right. I'm going to piggyback again on my last question about uh, multiple instances with the same name, right? So I have a tenant, I, I call it, uh, I call my instance name hp.com, and then I have another tenant that also calls his instance hp.com. What happens? There's two instances. You don't, what you, you, don't want, you don't want to create round robin DNS because it, yeah, and this is why it's an example. It's an example handler. It's not supposed. To, it's not supposed to be used okay. fully. It's it's to give people an idea of how you can take the notifications and use them, and then put in your own business logic. But if that driver would be used, it would create the round. It would create. There's no, there's too, no yeah. like tenant isolation or some. No, you you could if if you wanted to avoid that, you could put like you could the tenant name. I think comes down in the notification, so you could create machine name, tenant name, dot whatever domain is uh, assigned in the handler config. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, integration with heat? Um, yeah, we were just talking about this today. We really should do it. Um, 
Yeah, it's quite definitely on our roadmap, and it's something that we just need to sit down and do. Um, I'm not sure. I think he will take us into the control folder. But we, it is definitely, we, need, we, we aim to get it done soon. Another question. Um, integrating with how ice house, is it possible? Integrating? Designate with ice house. Uh, running it on an ice house stack, yeah, it's, it's possible. We've run it since Havana. I think even Juno should actually work with ice house. Might be some conflicts with the sync stuff because of maybe changing notification contracts, but okay. Keystone and stuff like that doesn't change, so it should work. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that's uh, kind of missing at the moment is uh, is applications uh, running across multiple availability zones and and using maybe DNS um, to provide wide IPs for DNS load balancing to get you to the the closest uh, regional availability zone is. Is that something that you, you see designate integrating with a, other projects to, to facilitate? The sort of the Route 53 style health checks for DNS records or? Yeah. Um, it's definitely something we've been talking about. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in Elbas at the moment that we should probably coordinate with. Um, it's difficult to know where the, how far the, down the road designate should go, but it's, we're open to suggestions if anyone has something they think we should be doing, please come talk to us and tell us. Um, we're more than welcome to hear how people want to use the project. And the, and, and the, other, the other question I've got is that um, when DNS breaks, it's, uh, it's a pretty bad yeah. situation. <laughs> you know? um, and because of that, there's a lot of, uh, especially in large enterprises, there's a lot of uh, nervousness around changing DNS. Um, and so to have a, you know, a, a system that allows uh, users effectively to go in and make changes to DNS that will go and sync into a production DNS instance is a pretty nervous situation in large enterprises. So you know, has that been factored in at all in what you've done or you've just enabled it? And I'm, it's, it's, it's in, I, I say designated is in use by large enterprises that they have delegated certain zones inside large enterprises to designate. It comes down to whatever your team is doing at the time. If they're dealing with your IT security people to, to prove that having the users be able to do it themselves is a valuable ability in a fast moving business. Okay, um, so you do, you do using it by zone delegation? Yeah, the, okay. nothing will resolve to it unless the, the say hp.com delegates example.hp.com to, to the designate name servers. Uh, it won't resolve example.hp.com until hp.com points their NS records for example.hp.com down to us. So, okay, so when you say points down down to us, so the back end, the back end name servers have got to be dedicated to the OpenStack instance. They can't be existing name servers that exist no. in your enterprise. Okay. Um, it's trying to manage and keep everything in sync with that will be quite difficult and it would be it would open up the opportunity to call to overwrite stuff that shouldn't be overwritten okay any other questions yeah the question was do you push any metrics to anywhere for billing purposes yeah, so um, at the moment, as uh, was another guy as well that asked for Salamander integration, but we don't have that yet. Or I mean, we in HP have like our billing stuff, so we build DNS, but at the moment there isn't any like integration between Designate and Salamander, but I guess, I mean, we're an incubated project, so it has to be on the roadmap, I guess, to provide that. We, like, we do emit events, though. Yeah. We do emit the, when you create a domain, create a record, delete a record, we do emit a notification event like every other DNS, pro or every other OpenStack project. Yeah, but we don't have anything gone into Salamur yet. Yeah. It's a roadmap item, yeah. I had a question about floating IP integration. What is... How does the fact that an IP floats or not have, it, uh, have to anything to do with the DNS 
uh, operation itself. What is the use case there? For example, if you have a floating IP assigned to your mail server and you want the reverse DNS for that to say mail.mycompany.com, um, that's the use case. Um, and it's generally, if, you get, if, if you're running a mail server, for example, that doesn't have a reverse DNS entry, it'll get marked as spam. So there's loads of use cases for people having reverse DNS control of their own IPs in their tenant. You can also, if you go to like a different use case, if you have Ironic, for example, in Triplio, you can have Ironic emit notifications when nodes come up into Designate, if you're running Designate in the undo client kind of. And Designate can then create like records automatically for, say, the ILO interface when it comes up or is discovered. That's like one use case. Any other questions? Uh, they asked if he had uh, limits to the number of zones or records that can be created. It's configurable, so the admin can decide for a tenant how many zones or records they can create. And if you go over that, you, you can't create it anymore. But so it's, it's, there's an API for it. Yeah, we have an API, and the client as well has, like, you can go, like, quota update and then, like, the tenant and the quota you want to set. Is that it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, I one last thing. Uh, we're both HP and Rackspace are hiring, so if you're interested, come talk to us. Ha, ha, ha.